Hi, Raj. Hi, hi. So, I'm Ewa Messer. I'm the producer and host of Poured Over. With me is Shannon DeVito, my partner in all things books at Barnes & Noble, and most Hello. importantly, Rajashree Varia, the author of The Daughters of Matarai, which was our March Barnes & Noble book club pick. So before we get started on all of the good stuff, because I know we're all chomping at the bit to get started on the good stuff, housekeeping. And if you've heard me say this before, well, we got to welcome everyone. So if you haven't heard me say it, this is the easy part. If you want to drop your questions in the chat, go ahead. You can also use the Q&A module. I'm going to be watching them throughout the event. I like to drop your questions in to the conversation as it's happening rather than holding them all to the end because, well, it's more fun if we can all participate at once. And the other thing is to remember, you were told this when you signed up for this book club event, but there are spoilers in this conversation because this is in fact the discussion after the fact. So be prepared. There are lots and lots and lots of spoilers in this conversation, but there's so much to talk about in this book. So before we really get into things, Shannon, I know why you picked this book for Barnes and Noble Book Club, but why don't you tell our audience? I read this and A, could not believe it was a debut. Um, and it was about a topic that I quite honestly didn't know a lot about. And reading it just made me, you know, first horrified and then fully interested and in diving into the kind of universal mother daughter relationships. It's a vivid story, the two alternate timelines, you know, definitely moving between both. And, you know, the, the horrors of the practice of female infanticide, but also anchored in these two kind of amazing, strong female characters. So I just thought it was right for discussion, right for book club, um, and honestly, a worthy pick for March. So how could I not pick it? Right. Um, and I'm excited to, to talk through it today. Okay. Raj, I need to know how this book started for you, because this is a really intense read. This is not like some sort of fluffy, let's all, you know, hold hands and have a great time. You do a lot of cool stuff in this book. I want to be clear about that, but it is also really intense. So let's talk about how it started for you. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, I've always been quite moved by social issues and the way mm -hmm. I've sort of expressed my emotions about them is, is through my writing. So um, this particular novel, it's been on in the works for quite a long time. When I was a child, um, nine or 10 years old, I have this vivid memory of um, watching the news with my parents. And there was a segment, um, this is back in Sydney, um, which is yeah. where I'm from. Um, and there was a segment about a case of female infanticide um, in Bangalore, which is where I was born. Um, and I think it was just an offhand comment from my mother um, who said, oh, Bangalore, that, you know, that's where you were born which immediately made me make the link between that baby girl and me and um, and the thought that that could have been me. Um, so that was my first introduction to the practice of female infanticide. And for a long time growing up, I'd been very interested in sort of children's rights and women's rights. And when I sort of thought about writing a novel length story, um, I thought it'd, it'd take the opportunity to explore the practice of female infanticide and sort of scratch that itch and try and understand why it occurs um, and trying to sort of express my my feelings about it. Yeah, I have to say too, I mean, the fact that parts of this book are set in the early 1990s, uh, that may have made some of us feel a little old, um, but at the same time, I mean, that's not that long ago. It's really not that long ago. So can you just bring people into Madurai and explain exactly where in India it is? Because Tamil Nadu is not really a place that everyone knows. And I think when you explain it and how you set the book there, it grounds us a little better in the story. Yeah, absolutely. So Tamil Nadu is the southernmost state in, or second southernmost state in, in India. Um, uh, very populous, very um, culturally different from the North. And I think mm -hmm. you definitely see a lot of writers who write about North India and, and right. um, the culture in North India. The culture down South is, is quite different. Um, I'm from Kerala, which is the neighbouring state, and, and the cultures of both states are, are really um, quite similar. Um, and it's got a, a great history, sort of Indigenous Indians um, sort of still live there um, and there's quite a rich culture and then it's quite interesting I think to see some of the practices mirror those in the north that sort of imported from um, the Middle East uh, and things like female infanticide and one of those things and I think because I'm so familiar with South Indian culture being from Kerala my parents took mm -hmm. me back sort of every every other year um, to make mm -hmm. sure that we had strong connections with our roots there finding out that there was this endemic practice of female infanticide right. so close to where my family are from. I still have family who live very close to the village where the, the book is set. Yeah. Um, 
it, it for me it hit really close to home. Um, I had the opportunity to go there and visit, you know, the villages where this takes place and speak to some of the women who have um, who have experienced it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I really wanted to bring that to life in the novel. So Shannon, you grew up in the states, and I mean, you do have family in Europe, but this was all kind of new for you as a reader. So what were you thinking as you started paging through? Daughters of Matarai, because I mean, it's it's kind of shocking. It is, and part of it was that it is so recent. It it mm-hmm. did feel so recent, and you know, a, a United States education is very focused on the United States a lot of times. Mm-hmm. So a lot of learning about other cu- cultures, you know, you're not as um, exposed to things like this. So reading through it, you know, I immediately. <laughs> I finished the book and then I went down a Wikipedia hole and a research hole and a, you know, the, the cradle project and things that have kind of cropped up because of it. Mm -hmm. So it did Mm -hmm. because it was something that I hadn't really seen and talked about in depth, especially in fiction too. It was, um, you know, I think it was an interesting point that just made me want to learn more, which is exactly what I Mm -hmm. want a book I read to do. So, Yeah. So Raj, I want to talk to you a little bit about the construction of this novel, because you do two very cool things beyond the mother and daughter story, which obviously we're going to come back to because that drives so much fiction, right? But you make a stylistic choice as you're bouncing back and forth between the 90s and the present day, you also switch voice and you switch tense. And I want to talk to you about how you decided that this was going to be the start. I know you just said a few minutes ago that this book has been in the works for a really long time, but that's a really specific craft choice that you made. And I'm wondering why you decided to do that. Great question. Um, so in terms of the the, uh, the tense, I think what I wanted to do was make it quite clear that the fictive present was um, Neela's voice. So it's in the in in the in 2018, mm-hmm. um, and so so keeping um, Delaney stories in the part in the past tense was sort of tried to make sure that was quite clearly delineated for the for the mm-hmm. reader. Um, the voice, though, um, the choice of, of first and third person mm-hmm. was very much about sort of the um, the. Uh, I, I guess it's just the fact that the um, Jadani had had so little autonomy and, and voice in her own life. Yeah, so yeah. her story is, is very much about being told by others. Um, and it's this idea of sort of Indian women, particularly in, in sort of this area, um, their stories are always told by other people. They don't have a voice. And, and so for me, putting her voice, it, putting her um, storyline in third person was just sort of an idea that she didn't quite have the same agency that, that Neela did, who is able to speak in, in the first person and present her story to the world in, in, in her own words. So that's why I decided to go, to go with those stylistic choices. It's a really great idea too. And I have to say there's some women... Uh... I'm trying not to be too hard on Janini's mother-in-law, who I really have been just thinking of as Darshan's mother, because I mean, that's her whole identity. She had a child, you know, she had a boy, she had a boy. So, you know, somehow she's safe from all of this. And she's really wretched, but the problem is she's wretched because she's been treated the same way. And she has no idea how to break out of this. And here's Janini who's like, yeah, I'm not doing this anymore. This is garbage. You keep taking my children and murdering them and I'm, I'm over it. So, I mean, Part of what I'm wondering for you is how did you know what your cast was going to look like? And I mean cast in terms of the characters. We're going to come to cast with an E later. Um, <laughs> but I, you knew you needed the mother. You knew you needed the daughter. You knew the time periods you needed and whatnot. But you could have had a much larger cast or you could have had actually a slightly smaller cast if you really wanted to. So let's talk about how you settled on these particular voices and how these characters came to you. And also Absolutely. with these voices, how you named them would be my question. The, the meanings of the names of each character I found so fascinating. Once I you know learned about them, I thought that was phenomenal. So also as you're developing the characters, just how you came up with their names and if that came first or if it was character first and then name. All great questions. Um, I think a lot of my inspiration came from my trip to to Motherai. Um, so I, I spent some time with a charity in yeah. in um, Motherai who worked to. Um, it's called the Women's Emancipation and Development Trust, and they worked sort of its grassroots organisation working to 
stamp out female and the practice of female infanticide. Um, and the causes of that are many, and a lot of that is, is just about education, about empowering families to educate their girls um, and pro providing them with the, um, the ability to do that. And when I was out there, I met a lot of amazing women. And from them and from their stories, I sort of developed the the stories that I wanted to tell, the context around the main characters, um, Janani and Neela. Mm -hmm. um, Janani, actually, her, her name comes from a woman I met. Um, I, I sort of stole her name. I, I think it's a beautiful name. But also she really st stuck with me. She was this young woman who um, had come to one of the clinics at the charity runs. And she had an older daughter and a young son. And she was telling me that, that she had experienced quite horrific abuse from her mother-in-law until she had... Mm -hmm her son and she she said at birth her son it was pure relief because prior to that her her um her mother-in-law had beat her pulled her out of the house by her hair done all this sort of stuff essentially driven her to a like a suicide attempt so I, it was, she really inspired me so that's where her name came from mm -hmm. um and the, the other part of the story that I really wanted to tell was this idea that there are men other actors there who are helping to break this this right. cycle um allies if you will um, and I wanted to give them a voice as well so that's where Sanjay's character came from I think mm -hmm. what was also quite interesting about that was the sort of the difference in in sort of um social class and, and status that Sanjay's family had and how that sits right alongside um this practice but is so untouched by it I, I find really interesting so I wanted to put that family there and sort of give a bit of context as to um as to sort of how, how that is possible and how those two communities sort of interact. Um, so, yeah, and, and uh, it, the cast could definitely have been a lot bigger. I think that's probably one of the hardest things when you're writing a novel is, mm -hmm. is sort of focusing. And I wanted to focus on those those two specific storylines and their specific um, points. So very long, long answer to that question. But no, but long good. answers are good, one, because <laughs> that's why we're here. This is the fun stuff. Um, we have an anonymous attendee dropping in a question. Do the current state of women's rights affect how you wrote about this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's definitely a lot of particularly grassroots movements that are looking to um, improve women's rights in India. Right. But you know, it's a constant struggle, I think. Um, definitely in, in these villages, there's a massive difference between where we were 30, 40 years ago and where we mm -hmm. are now. Um, okay. But, you know, it is, it, there's still such a long way to go. Um, you know, as you said, the 90s weren't that long ago. And that's sort of when um, this practice became sort of uh, brought to the forefront of conversation it's when the Indian government decided they needed to address it um, because you know a lot of international media were talking about it a lot of um, right. uh, Indian media were talking about it uh, and that sort of spearheaded this sort of you know uh, push to improve things um, so it is definitely getting better but but also I think both within India and in the diaspora there is still a long way to go in terms of equality um, between the genders all the genders um, but you know in, in this particular instance um, men and women so yeah no it's it is i try not to get all broody about the whole thing but it's it's really hard sometimes because the emphasis that's placed across asia on you know the next generation and making sure that your babies have babies and i'm like well you know your boy children need girl children to marry if you want to go that route right like i mean obviously there are many many different ways but adoption is less of a thing um in asia than it is in other parts of the world so it's kind of like there's this idea that you've got to have your own lineage right like your children have to have children and therefore ancestors can be on and it's just like well you still need the girl babies y'all like, I mean, China for a long time, a lot of those little girls were being sent to the States and being raised, you know, across the US, which is great. And yay, I mean, but at the same time, they're not in China. They're Americans now. So it gets it's a really good point. It, it really does. And I think, you know, it's very sort of, there's sort of very small bubbles that these communities live in. They're only right. looking at sort of the short term sort of. And, and what, what it means is in some states in the north of India, you've got such a dearth of women that you have, um, 
you have cases of women being kidnapped from neighboring states and brought in essentially for sexual slavery to be sold into marriage. Right. These women who you know can't speak the language of, of you know, the families they've been brought into, and essentially, since there are no women in in the local communities, they are they are now having to traffic in women um, to to have brides. So it's just a sort of cyclical. Um, horrific spiral um, and I think you know the biggest thing that you know a lot of these organizations are doing is is education and, expand, and breaking down the cultural causes of of female infanticide the idea of only you know boy children can carry on the family name um, only boys should be educated uh, dowry giving which is illegal but still happens all the time um, right. not just in India but in other parts of the world so it's addressing those issues is, is really and it's going to take time because it's educating the you know the younger generations really sure can we bring cast into the conversation for a second because scandal you know with Sanjay and Janini and how they end up I mean there are a lot of people who think of caste as being something that's almost synonymous with India. It does still have, like, it is still a very big deal. People marry within their caste. Um, you know, things happen within caste. Your life is determined by your caste. Can we talk about the research you had to do for this book? Because obviously you live in Australia. You are an Australian. You have a very different life. This is not something that's impacting you on a daily basis, but you have to get it right in order to be able to tell this story. Absolutely. I mean, there was a lot of research. I, I, there was a lot of amazing um, journalists and um, social researchers who've done work in in the area who whose research is devoured. Um, a lot of that, and then a lot of actually just you know uh, speaking to my own family, family mm -hmm. who live in India, um, right. spending time with them and understanding their you know their beliefs their their ideas around this particular story and how realistic it would be i mean definitely sanjay and janani's um you know relationship is would would even today be looked at as being like very sort of um almost unrealistic because the amounts right. of hardship it would be those two social um social classes to come together right. but also the fact that you know she's she's Tamil, she's Tamilian and, and he's from Kerala, you know, all of that sort of stuff would, would, would come in their way. So, but at the same time, it does happen, you know. Um, and I think, again, that's something that I wanted to address that, you know, yeah. that strength to be able to overcome um, the boundaries of, of gender and caste in India is, is takes, it takes a lot, it takes more than it should, um, but it is, it is possible and, and this is what the future could, could potentially look like. You know, I always, whenever I hear Tamil, I think immediately of Sri Lanka, which is, uh, that's me being an American because I just, you know, Tamil Nadu is like the second largest state in India. Like I should know that people are speaking Tamil. So how many languages does your average resident of Madurai speak? I mean, because everyone here is at least trilingual, you know, bilingual. I mean, they, it really depends uh, again on on your caste and, and your your social or your socioeconomic status really um but you know i think sort of your, your well educated uh, indian really will speak three or four languages so my my dad for example speaks sanskrit hindi malayalam and english um uh, all of them I mean, sanskrit is, is a dead language but um yeah. And all three of those languages uh, fluently, and a lot of Indians will do the same. They'll speak sort of their state language. They'll speak um, Hindi, and they'll speak English. So Hindi and English are the national languages of India. Um, and so they'll speak at least three languages, and often there's sort of a, like a regional dialect as well. So very, you know, I think there's something like the 16 official languages in India, and over 2,000 sort of sub languages right. and dialects. So. But obviously, Shannon, that didn't keep you like you never felt like you lost the thread of the story, right? Like you just knew exactly where we were. So I want to go back to mothers and daughters for a second, because I think Janini is really terrific. And I love Neela, but mm -hmm. I had some moments with Neela where I was like, hey, snotty little girl, you don't actually get to know everything about, you know, your parents were people before they were your parents. Um, but Shannon, I want to talk to you about sort of your favorite moments in their relationship separate from the the 90s like this mother-daughter relationship that's keeping us anchored in this story can we talk about some of your favorites i think uh, honestly it's and what i gravitated towards is you know neela's secret throughout the book and and how she 
is wanting to be herself with her mother and not fully, you know, thinking about, you know, we don't think about our parents as kids at one point and young adults is one at one point and young parents at one point and at how she starts to open up through this travel because of the funeral. And I think, um, that relationship she was able to build because of secrets finally coming to light secrets that had been secrets forever. I, that was the thing that I really gravitated towards. And I love the relationship be- between the two. My favorite character was actually um, Kamala, the midwife, because she didn't have to fill yeah. a role of mother, wife, daughter. She was kind of her own entity for, which is a double-edged sword, of course, in a community like that. But she, she is the one where that I, you know, found the most kind of sub- subversive power with, which I gravitate towards in fiction, I think. Mm-hmm. Okay, Raj, I know I'm not supposed to ask this because you're going to say all of my characters are my favorite children, but do you have a favorite character? Um, I would say that my favorite character is, is probably a Lavonica, the little, okay. little girl. Yeah. Uh, Moonbeam. Um, the little moon beam, yes. <laughs> um, I, I, for, for me, she just sort of symbolizes, you know, all of the potential of, of, you know, little girls, or children yeah. in India, and, um, and just the innocence in, in that, it, it, what is quite a, a dire social um, uh, context for her to be living in. She's still able to find that joy and having. I think for me, that's what, that's what she sort of personifies. So. Can we go back to mother-in-law for a second? Can we go back to Vandana? You're really not liking the mother-in-law. No, I and oh, I, Vandana, I should have oh I should God. have a I should have a little more compassion because obviously she doesn't have an out. She doesn't even see an out. Janini has at least some vision and she's got a chance because she's exposed to a lot of other things. And and Vandana, man, I she's not exposed to a lot. She's clearly not educated. Like, but man, she drove me up a tree because there is no sisterhood with mother-in-law. And I'm just, I'm having a moment, you know, for you as an outsider, right, Raj? Because this is, you are coming at it like, I have a story to tell, I have a point to make, I want to be heard. But I mean, how do you stay sane while you're writing this stuff? Because I mean, really, she had me just up a tree completely. I think for me, the writing about it is is how I get it out of my system. (laughs) I think, you know, I heard so many stories and doing the research, I, you know, I read so much, so much that was horrific. Um, and for me, sort of being able to write about it was, it was a cathartic in a way. It was like, you know, punching a punching bag or something. It was, <laughs> and, and, <laughs> um, but I think, you know, it's quite funny because in a lot of um, Indian entertainment, the mother, there's like a trope of the mother-in-law being really horrible. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and a lot of it is this sense of, you know, inflicting upon others what was done to you, like this cyclical violence, um, which I find really, really sad. And and also, obviously, it's terrible that there isn't a sisterhood there, but I feel like they've they've been sort of trapped in a corner and they don't really see anything except themselves as being able to get themselves out of the situation. They've, like, risen above it and they you know, everybody should experience what they've experienced and they're the only, you know, owners of their story. Yeah. And I'm really enjoying watching what's happening in the chat here because everyone's divided. It's great. This is exactly (laughs) why we we choose, but no, no, seriously, this is why we choose books like this. There are some people who are like, I totally get Neela, you know, and then there are other people who are like, oh no, I totally, yeah, it's, it's really, I love this when we get this conversation going and it's like, well, who do you have more empathy for? Well, you can have empathy for everyone, right? Like, I mean, Shannon said this, I've said, we've all said like, we can all have empathy, even if the mother-in-law is driving me up a tree. I do feel for her. I mean, what a horrific, horrific life, right? But I love the idea that everyone's like, no, I I just, everyone has their own POV and this is really just very delightful. Did you know how this book was gonna end, Raj, when you sat down? Were you like, people need their happy endings? Cause in a way you give us a happy ending. It's kind of great. Yeah, um, I, it took me a little while to, um, to sort of see how the story would end but I definitely wanted a happy ending I am an eternal optimist so right. for me <laughs> a happy ending is sort of me leaving the, the story and this issue on a on a hopeful note um and everybody loves love as well so it's just nice to see 
nice to see everybody getting uh, getting what they want at the end of it. Um, but yeah, it took a little while to to flesh out exactly how it was going to end without it being too cloying, which you know, mm-hmm. hopefully it's not. No, no, my God, it's totally not <laughs> canon. Back me up on this. This is, not, this is exactly the kind of story we wanted. I mean, everyone does get there. I also, I really liked the whole cousins thing because obviously when you grow up in the West and then you're back in Asia and like your cousins kind of have a different view of the world and her cousins are so groovy. They're so much fun. I really, I do like Neela's cousins quite a lot. Um, Shannon, favorite moment in the book? What did you love more than anything? Oh, wait, did I don't you know why freeze? I had this obsession with it. Did I what? Oh, no, did you're okay now. You froze for a second and now you're okay. I was Ooh. like, don't freeze while you're answering. I this did. <laughs> I, have, I have PTSD from our last book club <laughs> where I just completely shut off the first answer I was giving. So I'm still here, thankfully. Um, one of the, I don't know what it is about my obsession with naming, naming throughout the book, but when Janani decides to name Neela, Neela, and and that moment between her and Sanjay, and, and and it's the full, you know, she's leaving. It's the you know eternal optimist in me too that I knew it was going to end happily. Thank God, um, because you know you read a lot of fiction that is depressing and, and rightly so sometimes, but also it can be about dark things and still have an uplifting ending and kind of a hopeful view of the world. So it is, it, it's when she decided to name Mila Mila and it's a very small, you know, towards the end moment, but it's beautiful and it's moonbeam and what it means. It's just, I love that. How about you, Mila? Favorite, um, favorite part? Favorite moment. Uh... I think honestly, when Sanjay takes Janini to see the shop that becomes her sewing shop and she's like, oh no, I totally want this, but no, it's not a gift. It's a loan. I'm going to pay. Like, she's just like, no, 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 no. I mean, you're great and all, but I'm doing this. And I was just like, yeah, you'll be fine. I don't know what's going to happen, but you'll be fine. Um, I want to jump to the Q&A because we've had some people drop in some questions here. Would you ever write a mini story of Janini and Sanjay and their journey together of getting married, facing the challenges of his family's view and her experience of moving abroad to Australia for the first time? Yeah, that sounds great. (laughs) (laughs) I hadn't thought about it, but um, yeah, no, that sounds like I'd love to do that. So yeah, I will. I will one day. Okay. Well, we're leaving. <laughs> um, and then someone else is asking, what was the hardest scene to write in The Daughters of Madurai and why? Which is not a small thing. Yeah. Um, the hardest scene was <sighs> killing LaVonica. <laughs> um, yeah, you know. Yeah. That was, that was a tough one. Um, uh, it was... Uh, it was an emotional one to to write mm-hmm. yeah yeah okay was there a significance in the color green it was mentioned several times throughout the book and the color of the book is green as well i think oh uh, it was probably quite subconscious for me i think yeah. india is so lush I, and it is yeah. just so green it's green it's green and brown but I, I think you know just what i love about india is how lush it is and how green it is and Mm -hmm. um and then the other the other the the peacock colors like that sort of iridescent blue and and I think that is really beautiful as well so it's probably a subconscious thing but um it it is definitely what I think about sort of the coconut palms and the rice fields and all of that lush vegetation is is sort of embedded within me when I think about India it's pretty amazing all right but I am going to shift gears for a second and I want to talk about your writing practice because also Zinnia Morgan wants to know about your writing practice too. Uh, let's talk about how we got here. Who are some of the writers who helped you find your voice? What are some of the techniques? Like what's your practice look like? Let's let's get down to the nitty gritty and all the brass tacks, yeah? So where do you want to start? Of course. Um, so writers that helped me find my voice. I have always read really, really widely. Growing up, I loved fantasy and sci-fi of all things. Uh-huh. So, you know, a, a lot of... Um, writers like like Neil Gaiman for example I, I mm-hmm. love the, his writing David Mitchell's a cloud atlas um yep. his series books are, are really amazing as well um but I think particularly for, for this genre I think probably the writer that I most um sort of looked up to was Khaled Hosseini I love his yep. writing it's just so evocative and so emotional um and he just brings these 
you know, landscapes and issues to light in the most heartbreaking way. Um, so he's definitely one that I think um, I think about when I when I write um, when I write about particularly about issues like this. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, in terms of sort of my my writing practice, so I, I sort of started off writing short stories, which I think a lot, you know a lot of writers do. It's it's a nice sort of you know bite sized chunk okay. of a of a story, um, and a lot of it a lot of that was again around sort of social issues. So some mm-hmm. of my previous um, short stories have been sort of uh, around sort of dowry burning and and child soldiers, all really uplifting stuff. But as I mentioned, I I, I like to sort of um, it's quite cathartic for me to write about some of these issues when I'm quite interested in them. Um, and, and then I sort of decided to write sort of novel length. And for me, it was sort of a bit of a mixture of plotting the story and, and just right. going with the flow. So I think the beginning of the story, I sort of write into it just to try and find the characters' voices and, and try and get a sense of a bit of colour on, on sort of mm. the, the real um, nitty-gritty of the novel. And then I'll take a step back and sort of go, okay, where am I actually going with this? Because what I'm hearing as you say that is you started as a reader going for story first and character came later for you. Shannon, I know you bounce back. I mean, you read like I do. It's sometimes you're reading for story, sometimes you're reading for language, sometimes you're reading for character. I get that. But when you said Khaled Hosseini, my first thought was, oh, you know, he, for the last book in The Mountains Echoed, Alice Munro, the Canadian short story writer with the Nobel, she was one of his biggest influences on that book. And I was like, oh, I get that. I totally, totally get that. And I'm like, so language and character found a whole new way into his work as well. So I love hearing the evolution of sort of what you've been doing and and how you've been doing it, because you are really trying to tell a very epic story in not a lot of pages, right? I mean, you're trying to cover a lot of points here. Yeah. You're right. I, I definitely, it is, it's a story, I think, initially that fundamentally drives me. But then by exploring that, then characters sort of spring to life and start to add, co- add colour to that. So, Shannon, when you were reading Daughters of Matarai and deciding whether or not we were going to make it book club, I mean, you went for the characters first in this case, right? And the story, story was a bonus, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I find myself the last the last few years it has been character driven. Mm-hmm. And it was yeah. Janat specifically that I was like, this is a woman we need to talk about. And that's really what what drove it home for me and her, you know, her coming into her own in the most effective way possible of just leaving yep. um I thought it just needed to be talked about so it really was kind of character first but then the story and the you know the the thematic hits that happen throughout yeah. the book are really what flesh it out and you know make it feel to use your green word lush yeah. um that kind of lends it lends itself for discussion Hey, Raj, Evelyn Bariz, uh, Barizi, Baris, I hope I'm saying your last name correctly, Evelyn, is asking, what's the feedback been from young women um, of Indian backgrounds? It's been amazing. I think a lot of um, what I've heard a lot is that it the story resonates with them. Um, they're able to see themselves in the story. They're mm-hmm. able to see their experience of India in the story. And for me, that that means a lot um, because it it means that the story is, feels authentic um, to to people of, of Indian background, which is really important to me. Yeah, and I think it's really important too that Neela is uncomfortable when she's home in Madurai. Like, yes, it's where her parents are from, but like when she goes for a run and her mom is like, please don't do that. And she's like, oh, you know, and she's being a little snotty about it. And, um, and then her cousin is like, no, dude, seriously, like don't go for a run here. Like what is wrong with you? And I mean, we, okay, some of us have had those moments where it's like, I'm going for a run and everyone's looking at you going, no, please don't do that. So like we all have these ideas, right, that we bring from whatever our background is, whether we're the mother-in-law or Neela or whatnot. And I just, I love the way all of these ideas come together and sort of smack each other on the forehead, right? Because you're just like, wait, wait, I have a point of view. And it's like, well, yeah, you do. And it's not that it isn't relevant. It's not that it isn't like, it just isn't the same point of view as this person down the road. And I love that about this book. It's just that constant swirl of everyone kind of, you know, talking and and really, you know, figuring out what's going on. Um, How much of writing is rewriting for you? This is something I love to ask authors because I think there's this idea, right, that writing, you just put it all out and, you know, get a draft out. It'll be fun. It's like, well, actually. It's a really, it's a really good question. With this novel, actually, when I submitted it um, to agents, it was on its third draft. 
Okay. So the first first draft and and the final draft um, quite substantially different. But in between, there wasn't quite a lot of, of tweaking to do. So for me, it's like I will write through that first draft, which is almost a draft zero. It's just trying to get the story on the page, it's like getting the material there. And then the next couple of drafts is very much about sort of molding and sculpting it. But yeah, at the moment, I, it does seem to be sort of like by three or four drafts, I've, I've kind of got the bulk of the story in the shape that it needs to be in. Right. Um, yeah. Okay, listen, I am, as always, keeping an eye on the clock because that is part of the reality of Book Club. We could all sit here for hours and hours and hours. I want to get back to the questions in the Q&A for a second. Um, a couple of us wondering, you know, how do, we cha how do we get infanticide to stop? Like, what can we do to help bring about change? Because it is deeply tragic. And, you know, it is something that it's just so frustrating. But can we help from a distance? It's a really good question. I think there are loads of fantastic um, organizations in India, the grassroots ones in particular, who really understand where, where the, the root cause of female infanticide is coming from. Um, you know, I, I think there have been a lot of sort of government initiatives at sort of at a higher level that have tried to stamp it out, but they're treating the symptoms rather than the cause. And and the cause really is some of these ingrained beliefs that are right unrealistic which is um and i think the, the key to that is is education of both boys and girls um from a very young age um about sort of gender equality and, and gender roles so mm -hmm. i think I, just being role models to um you know young women young girls around around you is really important to to make sure that just in, even in gender equality or is something that we're all fighting for in our context um, mm -hmm. across the world. It's not just right. in this area. So, you know, practicing that at home, I think is really important. Mentoring young, young girls um, sort of locally, mm -hmm. but the amazing organizations that you can get involved with um, the, who are based in India, even if it's a voluntary type thing, or, you know, if you've got skills in, in education and that sort of thing going out and, and helping, um, but obviously sort of donations as well to help them. Yeah, microloans can help. Microloans can definitely help. I mean, especially in rural communities. Absolutely. Um, Actually, yeah. I'm going to go back and reference Bandit Queens by Parini Shroff for a second, because that is one of the ways that the women in that community as well were able to sort of get their act together and pool microloans and, and go from there. And I do like I'm talking about twenty five dollars. Like, yeah. I, yeah. I, yeah. we're not even talking like a hundred dollars. It's it's amazing what you can do um, for folks in in certain communities. Um, Okay, a couple more questions. And actually, Shannon, this one's for you. And before we go back to Raj, because I have more questions for her, um, Clementine Stowe Daniel, who I'm pretty sure I saw your name at the last book club event. BNN folks, how do you go about choosing the book club books? Everyone this year thus far has been amazing, and they have been. So Shannon, you want to speak to that, and then we'll go back to Matt or I for a second? Well, the, the short answer is we read a lot. Yeah, we do. Yeah, <laughs> we, we do. <laughs> uh, there's, there's a group that reads, there's booksellers that reads, we read books that come out, you know, 10 months in advance, five months in advance, four months in advance. Um, and they all kind of coalesce into this group that we pull from of books we're passionate about or books that, you know, keep coming up in discussion and, and books that kind of really make people think. Um, and, you know, one way or the other is, is kind of ripe for a debate or a discussion or a polarizing view on one of the characters or something that may not be touched on a lot in fiction. Mm -hmm. um, so it is, it's a group of booksellers and we, we read a whole lot and then we select our favorite and this is one of them. And we talk a whole lot before we talk to you guys. That's yeah. really, <laughs> we talk a lot. <laughs> we talk a lot about a lot of books. It's really quite a nice way to, you know, start your day actually. It's just kind of like, well, I loved this and then everyone gets their thing going. Um, Raj, do you have any books, not necessarily related to Madurai, but like, do you have anything that you love recommending to other readers? Just, you know, an author that you adore? I mean, I know you mentioned Cloud Atlas a second ago. I know you mentioned Khaled Hosseini, but like, you know, those are in the context of Madurai. Is there just something that just makes you go swing every time you think about it? I, great question. Uh, I said two two authors. One I um I absolutely love Maggie O'Farrell completely. I just love yeah her yeah yeah. Style. Oh my yeah. god, we love her too. <laughs> <I> mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, anything that she's written, I will read. Um, 
she's absolutely amazing um and then I, I also absolutely adore Yag Yasi and everything that she's ever written um so Was Incandescent Kingdom and, and Home Going they're amazing amazing books um, and and again it opens your eyes culturally I think um to a completely different world so a, a beautiful writing so um yeah those two in particular and also I, thematically I, both of them fit and Maggie's work and yeah Jesse's work they they both fit with what you're doing in Matter Eye so it it makes a ton of sense that these are women that I mean they just make my heart go pitter patter every time I see a new book from them um exactly. also we have a couple of folks who are really kind of mad that Lavinka had to die <laughs> yeah asked, sorry why did you do that <laughs> Um, and my answer is dramatic purposes, but do you want to do you want to address that? Because really, people want to know. I mean, dramatic purposes is a great answer, but I, I think um, I think the other thing I wanted to just explore in the novel was just how ephemeral life is outside of even is, is cultural uh, norms. I mean, road accidents in, in India kill a ridiculous amount of people, um, and then you know, there's just a whole whole host of other other issues um, that people face on a daily basis. So that's sort of what I wanted to wanted to explore, um, but also dramatic purposes. Okay, and I just had um, Audrey ask, it's Maggie O'Farrell, I'm, Audrey, I'm dropping her name into the chat, and then yeah, Jesse, let me hey, just Jessie. drop her name in as well. Um, I'm missing an A, hold on for two seconds. Home going and transcendent kingdom, yeah. both phenomenal. So, um, yes, Audrey, I just dropped Maggie O'Farrell and yeah, Jesse's names in there. Um, do not miss on it, uh, they're just they're both spectacular, spectacular. Um, let me just make sure that we're not. Oh, you know what? Here's another one. How do you want readers to feel when they finish the book? What do you want them to take away? I primarily I wanted them to take away hope. I think hope is the the, the biggest emotion that I'd love readers to take away from this novel and the other thing is 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 really very much just a, a bit of an understanding around female infanticide um and how how it impacts across cultures I think it's the other the other piece I think that hope is really important um I think it's really really important Shannon what did you love more than anything about Matarai? I, I, it was the optimism at the end um I I was scared in the beginning that the, it was going to be just sad and, and a tough topic and worthy, you know, of, of this conversation, obviously, but the fact that there was hope at the end is, and it's also what helps make it memorable and a rec recommendation worthy. And it's an experience in and of itself. And it gets you thinking about, you know, what we referenced earlier of, of what we can do and what we can think about right. and what we can look into. Um, it is, it's the optimism around it. Okay, and I'm totally, I've been sitting on this, I've been totally sitting on this, it's more because it's more of a statement than a question. Uh, Christine Ongano says, I found the writing absolutely gorgeous, lots of exclamation points. It made such a difficult and unpleasant subject more mm, palatable. And yeah, I mean, we're all sort of working with the emotions of this book, right? I mean, it is rough. And yet, you know, literature is a thing that brings us through the rough stuff, right? I really felt like I was literally in Matter Eye. I will happily read anything you write from here on out, which is always That's fun. Wonderful. <laughs> um, and then Barbara Levine is asking, how prevalent is the caste system in India? Are there still untouchables? Which I, my understanding is we now call untouchables Dalit, and we don't use the untouchables phrase. So can you just speak to that before I have to do more housekeeping? Sorry, guys. <laughs> the glamour never <laughs> So technically speaking, the caste system is illegal in India, but that means nothing. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's deeply entrenched. So um, it's still a massive part of Indian society. Yeah. Um, it influences everything from um, the economy to politics to you know social relationships, um, and it, it it very much impacts the diaspora as well. So I think there are some amazing writers um, that I will have to <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, drop a yeah. note around on email who write about you know um how the caste system impacts indians in the us for example um and, and across the diaspora because it can impact the way that you know you're treated by colleagues who are indian of a different different caste background um so there's a lot of caste discrimination that still happens even if somebody asks you what your surname is right. rather than ask you what village you're from and um and you're you know that they're trying to find out what cast you're from to understand how they're going to treat you. So unfortunately, it's still deeply ingrained and something we're still fighting. fighting yeah. Against. Okay. Nikki Parasol Friedman has just jumped in under the wire. I want to hear a bit about her amazing depiction of the mother-daughter relationships just in general, above and beyond being in India as a mother of a daughter and obviously a daughter myself. Just wow. You want to talk about mothers and daughters for a second? 
Oh, of course. I think that's such a lovely thing to hear. Um, obviously, I, I have a wonderful mother and, and we've mm -hmm. had a complicated relationship and I, I, I draw a lot from that. Um, but I also have just had uh, my own daughter. I have a three month old daughter um, and that's been quite amazing, actually. So yeah. I, it's something I've always wanted to be, I want, I've wanted to be a mother. And yeah. so being able to explore that relationship um, through the book has been really wonderful. So that's so awesome to hear. I mean, I'm quite fond of mine as well. I think I'll yeah. keep it. <laughs> Um, my mother really? got it, so I should say. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Shannon, do you have any thoughts you want to leave our book club audience with before I do some housekeeping? Just a, a thank you for joining this discussion. And thank you, Raj. This has been phenomenal. And a, a bug in your ear about whatever next project you're working on or writing currently or have in the pipeline long down the road, you know, BNN will be ready and waiting to support it wholeheartedly. <laughs> And Thank Nikki's so recommending, yeah, Nikki's recommending the book to everyone she knows as well. So, you know, you have a whole bunch of people talking about this. Um, nice. For those of you who are asking, we do post the recording of this event to the Barnes and Noble YouTube channel. So you can find it probably give us a couple of days to, you know, there's a lot going on. So give us until next week, maybe to get it up on the BNN YouTube channel. And our next event is Jeanette Walls on May 9th here on the internet, um, talking about Hang the Moon. So feel free to join us for that. The um, All of the details are usually on BN.com or Eventbrite or both. And I should know this off the top of my head, but guess what? I am riffing completely because I can't remember where to send you guys. So apologies. Oh, and actually, yeah, there's there's now in the chat. If you look in the chat, Gina just dropped it in the chat. So we're all good. I just want to say thank you again, Raj, Shannon. This was great. I'm sorry to let you guys go because we could all seriously hang out here for so much longer. But that said, unfortunately, we gotta go. So thank you so much for all of thank you, everyone. Well. This was awesome. Thank, thank you, you BNN Book Club members. It's always good to see you. And I'm so excited to see all of these names recycling. So I'm delighted you guys keep coming back. Anyway, have a great afternoon, everyone. We'll see you at the next one. Bye. Bye. Bye.